G'day folks, ZD here and welcome to my beginner's guide to Last Epoch, the upcoming action RPG from 11th Hour Games, currently available in early access. Over the course of this guide I'll get you acquainted with the game's unique takes on character building, looting and crafting, arming you with everything you need to succeed on your own. While being a fairly deep and complex game, Last Epoch is quite beginner friendly. This is thanks in part to easier character respects, alongside powerful and easy to engage with item crafting. So don't be afraid to jump into this game without a build guide. This guide itself is a primer to the raw skills you need to make your own build work. But if you want some inspiration, there's certainly nothing wrong with scoping out some builds to see what's possible. In Last Epoch, the first decision you make is your class. Each class has three masteries, subclasses that you can specialize in, but more on that later. Your class is one of the few things you cannot change, but every class has a bunch of powerful playstyles and builds. So there's no wrong choice here and pick what appeals to you. As you level and complete quests, you'll gain passive points you can spend in your base class and mastery passive trees. Initially, you can only place points into your base class. Spend them freely on whatever you think will help your character progress, as it's very easy to change them later for a small gold cost at the respec NPCs in towns. Look for the little purple head symbol. Below each passive you can see the max points that can be invested into that passive, and some passives you'll notice are linked by lines with dots. These are requirements in order to unlock the passives on the right of the line. The dots tell you how many passives you need in the left passive to unlock the one on the right. On the left of the screen you can see your masteries. In order to unlock these you need to reach the end of time zone and speak to an NPC in that zone as part of a quest. This is around level 25. You'll also choose a subclass to master at this point as well. This is the only thing you cannot respec so choose carefully. You can spend passive points in the left half of any of the mastery trees, but you only have access to the right hand side, the advanced section, of the mastery you choose to actually master. Your chosen mastery also confers a set of passive bonuses listed on the left, and some of these can be quite impactful. Pick the mastery that you think best aligns with the build or playstyle that you envision, and while you will be locked into that choice, each mastery has viable playstyles. Now remember, while most powerful nodes are usually buried deeper in your chosen mastery, don't be afraid to spend a couple points outside of your mastery class. Especially useful can be things like nodes with bonus resistances. Another tip to remember is that you can bring up the waypoint map and down in the bottom left see how many passive points rewards that you have currently earned. You should keep doing side quests that grant passive rewards until you claim all possible bonus passives. Initially you start with one skill and then unlock new ones from your base class as you level. To use an unlock skill, click a binding spot on your UI and select it from the list. Make sure to at least try everything out to get a feel for your options. You'll unlock even more skills as you spend points in your base class's passive tree, and later on you'll unlock even further skills as you put passives into the mastery trees. Every skill in Last Epoch has its own skill tree, which you can access by specialising in that skill. You unlock specialization slots as you level, 5 in total. I suggest you start by specializing a primary damage dealing skill first. When a skill is specialized, it will begin gaining experience as you kill enemies. You don't have to specifically use it, just having it specialized is enough. As it levels, you will gain skill points you can invest into that skill's specialization tree. By using the respect button in the top right, you can despecialize a skill to specialize a new one in its place, or you can sacrifice a level to remove an individual point from that tree. In both cases, to regain your skill points you just need to gain some more experience. Re-leveling a newly specialized skill or regaining respect points takes less and less time the further you get in the game. And there is also a catch up mechanic as well, so don't be afraid to drop a skill and try a new specialization or move some points around. That said, it can be a little tough if you drop your main damage dealing specialization without having a suitable replacement, so keep that in mind. Skill trees have a mixture of minor and major stat boosts, very powerful buffs, and options to outright change how the skill functions. Your most important tool here is the power of reading. Read through your options and consider how they might interact. Considering how the different nodes can alter your skill's functionality and boost its effects can have huge benefits for your build. For example, Lightning Blast is a zappy lightning skill. There are a few options to make it chain, which is great for killing more enemies at once. But, reading the Convergence node, we can discover that we can instead make those chains hit the same enemy as the initial zap, turning the skill into a powerful boss killer. Reading further into some of the nuances, I know that Convergence will half the chain amount and round it up. So, if I get 5 chains, it will half down to 2.5 and then round back up to 3 chains, 
all hitting the same target. Very nice. Think about what role you want a skill to play. Read through your options and try things out to see if you can make it fit that role. Generally, I suggest aiming to have a powerful single target skill, a skill for killing larger groups of enemies, a movement skill, and a defensive skill. This will usually leave you with a spare specialization to incorporate some additional utility, such as a skill that buffs your defense or offense in some way. Before we talk about gearing and crafting, let's talk about how to deal damage. In addition to picking some nice skill tree and class passives, you need to understand how you primarily deal damage and how to go about making those numbers go up. It's a good idea to keep in mind what your build skills do. Are they fire damage, spells or attacks, damage over time? Keep these facts in mind as you proceed. Each skill and build will have its own methods of scaling up its damage, with varying levels of impact to each approach. It's nearly always going to come down to having some good combination of damage scaling options, and finding that best combination is part of your fine tuning process. That said, let's go over a general outline. To scale hit damage builds, both spells and attacks that deal all their damage at once, you want the following. Added flat damage, usually represented as something like plus 30 melee damage. Increased damage, represented by a percentage 30% increased fire damage or something like that. More damage, which is usually represented by plus 30% damage or 30% more damage, or mentioned as multiplicative. Cast speed or attack speed for appropriate skills that scale with those critical strike chance and critical multiplier for builds that are going crit, and plus levels to X skills available in gears which gives you more skill points to spend in their skill trees, and things that lower enemies defenses like armor shred and resistance penetration. Now added flat damage is always good and tends to play a bigger role in attack builds than in spell builds. Weapons have some added flat damage built into them as implicit stats, and this damage increases a lot with higher level weapons, so be sure to seek out new weapons as they begin to appear. You can look for ones that have other nice benefits for your build, but that raw damage is initially the most important thing in these sorts of builds. Increased damage is always welcome, and tends to come from gear and passives. However, it often competes with other options for damage scaling, which can in some cases be more impactful, such as attack or cast speed and critical strikes. More damage multipliers have a bigger impact overall, and these tend to come from skill specializations themselves, the skill trees. More damage is generally high priority and will have a big impact on your damage overall, though it may sometimes be outclassed by something that has a greater utility to the skill. Now depending on the skill, attack and cast speed can have a big impact as well, as they allow you to take all of your scaled up damage and dish it out more often, acting as a more multiplier all of its own. A similar thing applies to Critical Strike Chance and Critical Strike Multiplier. Speed and Crit will often outclass increased damage on the right skill and build. So let's make it nice and simple. In summary, stack added flat damage, percentage increased and more damage of the correct types, and scale speed or crit if it fits your skill. Then supplement with increasing skill levels and lowering monster armor or resistances. Damage over time element builds function a bit differently in Last Epoch. Each damage over time type has a preset damage amount that you can see in the ailments section in the in-game guide. Press the G key. As a side note, this menu is great for learning specific information about terms or ailments. For damage over time builds, the things you want to scale your damage are more percentage chance to apply the ailment in the first place. 200% chance to ignite means that you apply two stacks of ignite when you hit. More of this chance to apply an ailment is better, and most common dot ailments don't have a limit to how many stacks you can apply. Check the game guide for how your ailments work and scale. The next thing you want is more hits with which to apply your ailment. Cast and attack speed can increase how many ailments you apply, or just a multi-hitting skill that hits an enemy a bunch of times. Next up, increased or more damage of the ailments type will scale the base damage of the ailment. For example, 100% increased fire damage will scale ignite. Generic more damage from skills such as plus 8% damage in skill trees will also work. Anything that specifies something like melee or spell though generally won't work. Next up, you can scale some ailments duration. Longer duration means more stacks, so that's more damage. And finally, ailment resistance penetration or lowering the relevant monster resistances help. Remember that armor doesn't work for damage over time. As such, there's no point lowering enemies' armor if you're a damage over time build. So let's make it simple again. In summary, for damage over time builds, apply as many stacks of your ailment as you can, as quickly as you can, and try and get percentage damage scaling for your ailment. Supplement by getting ailment duration 
and lowering enemy resistances of the right type. Now let's talk about the other side of the equation, keeping yourself alive. So here's a priority list in rough order that will help keep your health above zero. Defensive skills or mechanics are at the top of the list. Every class has one or several powerful defensive skills or mechanics, like Flame Ward on the Mage for example. These are often the most impactful things for your survival, so use them and use them well. Next up, added health, vitality, and percentage increased health. Anywhere you can get increased health percent, you should, though this tends to not be until endgame. While leveling, flat health and vitality are sufficient. Now resistances are not quite as impactful as in some other action RPGs, but they're still very helpful and high on the priority list in most cases while leveling. Resistances cap at 75% and capping is great, but being a bit lower than that is not too big a deal, especially for leveling. In Last Epoch, going down from 75% to 70% resistance means you take 5% more damage, as opposed to the 20% more damage you take in other games because of how the math works. Poison resistance is also a resistance that you can generally leave a little bit lower than the others. Physical is one that you want to try and keep as high as you can. Of course, if you have the option, tuning your resistances to the content that you're facing can be quite helpful. Next up is armor. Armor protects against any hit damage, whether physical, elemental, or void in this game. It is 100% effective against physical damage and only 70% effective against other damage types, but the fact that it works against other damage types is great. Armor doesn't help against damage over time at all though, keep that in mind. Armor is really effective overall at keeping characters alive, but not every build and class gets support or room to scale it. If your resistances are good and you already have health on the item, then armor may be your next best choice. Critical strike avoidance or similar effects allow you to completely mitigate critical strikes, and this is a high priority in later endgame, but it's not important or really feasible to scale while leveling. You can pretty much get away with ignoring Critical Strike Avoidance and similar until empowered monoliths for the most part, except perhaps in Hardcore. Next up is Endurance. This is a powerful form of mitigation unique to Last Epoch. It provides a reduction to the damage taken while at low health. It does function against one-shots and even if you're at high health when you take the actual damage. There are two stats associated with Endurance. Endurance Percentage, which increases the mitigation amount, and Endurance Threshold, which makes it protect a larger portion of your health pool. Both can be very impactful. Some classes like Primalist have extra support for Endurance scaling, though it's excellent on any life build. Endurance however does not protect Ward. Long term stacking Endurance is a very powerful boost to any life build, but it's not really feasible while leveling in many cases. Next up we have Block, which is obtained mainly from shields, but some other items and passives can grant or improve it. Shields overall are very powerful defensive items in this game. You can scale block chance and the amount of damage blocked, block effectiveness. There are some really nice other stats you can also get with block, such as percent less damage taken on block and health gained on block. If you can use a shield in your build, it can be a very nice defensive increase, and hardcore players will often prioritize one. Finally, we have dodge, which is a chance to completely avoid hits, and it can be stacked by anyone, but Rogue has the most support for it. Dodge is proper random in Last Epoch and not deterministic with some sort of scaling or anything like that, so it does pretty much exactly what you'd expect from the stat. It is powerful, but it's unreliable as such. A few builds will exploit dodge well, but most builds will not bother with it. Now I didn't mention Ward in that list, as it's an alternate approach and much more build specific. Ward is an extra protective layer above your health, and it can be generated in many different ways, such as passively over time, on hit, or as a burst on skill use. Ward decays over time, and ward retention helps you maintain a larger amount of ward. Everything in the previous list applies to ward builds apart from endurance. Ward is a very powerful defensive mechanic in the right build and with the right gear, but ward builds tend to be a bit more specific and nuanced in nature. So now that you have an idea of what you're looking for on gear and how to scale your character, let's talk about acquiring that gear and improving it. Gear in Last Epoch can drop in several different rarities. Normal, which is just basic white items with their implicit stats. Magic, which can have 1 to 2 random affixes, and rares, which typically have 3 to 4 random affixes. Unique items, which are pre-built and have their own unique effects. Set items, like uniques but with bonuses for wearing multiple items from that set. Exalted rare items, which have one or more exalted affixes, modifiers with stats boosted beyond the regular limit. And finally, legendaries, which are specifically improved and crafted unique items. You can compare items that you're wearing to ones that you've picked up by holding control. You can make this behavior default in the options with auto compare items if you like as well. You can also hold alt to see more contextual information on affixes and item effects. This is very handy while learning. 
And finally, you can also hold Ctrl and Alt together to see affix tiers and roll ranges. Now let's talk crafting. Forging your own items in Last Epoch is incredibly powerful and a fundamental part of your gear progression. In some action RPGs, crafting is a side endeavor or not something that you bother with until you're rich and famous. But here you can start crafting almost right away and it will keep being a huge part of your gearing experience forever. Learning how to gear your character and learning how to craft are in many ways the same thing in this game. Now I've already made an in-depth beginner's guide to crafting in Last Epoch, so check out that video and I'll link it in the description below. In this guide though, I will speak more to a beginner's crafting strategy while progressing your first characters. So step one is whenever you have spare gold and pass by a vendor, buy all of the runes of shattering that you can afford. You'll basically always do this until you're flush with shattering runes at endgame. These runes allow you to break down an item and get affix shards from that item that you can use for crafting. I'll speak about how to best use them in a little bit. Hand in hand with step one, not that it really needs to be said, but pick up the affix shards that randomly drop like they're free candy. Now step two is what I'll refer to as simple crafting. This is super straightforward and lets you make the items you find better while you level. This is the sort of crafting that will carry you from level one to 50 and into endgame quite comfortably. It goes like this. Whenever you find an item that looks like it might be an upgrade, or could be an upgrade, put it in the forge, and just start adding and increasing affixes. Items that drop with one or two good stats and higher level item types with more powerful built-in implicits should all just go in the forge to try and improve them. If you're in doubt, try and upgrade everything on your character every 10 levels or so at least. At that point, it's quite likely that there's a much more powerful item base available to you now, and upgrading should be pretty easy if you get it. Your simple order of priorities is to add or increase life and vitality, resistances and movement speed on boots, and then put damage and scale those damage scaling stats up that fit your build. As a little tip, runes of discovery can add random affixes to empty slots for free, and they have no forging potential cost and are fairly common, so don't be afraid to use them. Remember that any stat is generally better than no stat. Glyphs of hope can be used while leveling on the more promising items. They give a 25% chance of a free craft. Though I recommend trying to keep 10 or 20 of them set aside for more major crafting projects when you get to endgame and start finding more powerful items. Even if you're not sure if an item will end up being an upgrade, just put it in the forge and try. You'll frequently be surprised how good items can end up being. This is a very powerful crafting system here. And either way, the more crafts you do, the more familiar you'll get with the system and the affixes in the game making later crafting projects much easier. Now step three is to use those shattering runes that you've been collecting. Use them on items with good affixes for your build, rare looking affixes, and generally good affixes that you want a lot of. Shattering runes can recycle old items or failed crafting attempts as well. Good affixes for your build will make sense the more you figure out your build. Don't worry if you're not at that point yet. Rare affixes are generally anything that looks pretty fancy or that you don't see too often. Things like plus levels to a skill, or affixes that have multiple lines of text. You'll get more familiar over time again, don't worry. Good affixes that you want a lot of are things like health, movement speed, and your specific damage type like increased lightning damage for example. That's because you'll use these a lot and they can become a bottleneck, so it's a good idea to get as many of them as you can early on. If you're in doubt, just shatter anything that you don't think you'll need. It's not worth vendoring rare items for gold in this game, and the more affix shards you get, the better. As you learn more, you'll start shattering less things because there will simply be too many items to shatter them all. As you start to build a huge stockpile of affix shards, you can stop using shattering runes on basic items and focus more on rare affix and specific ones you need as you learn what those are. Now, after you've been basic crafting for a while, step four is to start exploring some of the other crafting options available to you. Around level 40 or 50 is a good time to start as items become more powerful. Affix is more interesting, and you're more likely to keep using a well-crafted item for a while at these levels. A great place to start is Glyphs of Chaos. Say that you find an item that looks really good for your build, but it's got that one tier 3 affix that does nothing for you, like minion damage and you're not a minion build. Try using a Glyph of Chaos to change that affix first to something relevant, and then polish off the other affixes with Glyphs of Hope. You can sometimes make really good items by surprise this way, and it's a great way to learn what sort of affixes appear where. Beyond step 4 is where we start to get into more advanced crafting, which is more relevant to endgame. Again, check out my full crafting guide for more information. 
Now as a little bonus aside, here's a big leveling tip. There are two guaranteed unique items from the Ezra's Ledger quest, and they're both excellent leveling items. Quite early in the campaign, in the Council Chambers, you'll be given a side quest to fetch Ezra's Ledger from a nearby zone. It's quite a quick quest, and it gives one of two possible guaranteed uniques. Both of these are excellent leveling uniques, but you want to choose the right one for your build. If you give the Ledger to the Gambler Artem, you will get the Gambler's Fallacy Amulet, which gives life on critical strike. If you give the Ledger to Ezra, then you will instead get the Glove's Avarice, which give elemental resistance and life leech on elemental damage. If you're doing any elemental damage, including damage over time, then you should go for Avarice as they are very powerful gloves and usable right into endgame. Otherwise, Gambler's Fallacy can be a nice damage boost for big hitting builds early on and give some very nice life sustain when you crit. Some builds, like a Poison build for example, won't really use either of these, but for the builds that can, it's well worth picking the right one, so pay attention to this quest. Now back to the rest of gearing. Idols are Last Epoch's take on charms, and they're a very powerful slot for boosting your build and shoring up weaknesses. Idols are items that only work when placed in the idol inventory, and they only ever have two affixes which are rolled randomly when they're dropped. Idols cannot be crafted, so always be on the lookout for good ones. Idol slots are unlocked by doing side quests in the campaign. You can open the waypoint map to see how many idol slots you still have to unlock in the bottom left. Check your current side quests to see which ones offer idol slot expansions. The smaller idols, the 1x1s and the 1x2s, are available to every class and have more generalized affixes on them. Health, resistances, specific damage and ailment chance, generally speaking. These are incredibly useful for increasing your resistances to shore up gaps in the rest of your gearing. If your resistances are fine, then you can use these smaller idols to focus on getting more health and a small damage increase. But early on, life and resistances will be the most important things. Stout idols, the up-down ones, can roll with flat and percentage health. These are the chase rolls for these, and when your resists are good enough, you'll want to have some of these, so keep them safe if you find them. Humble idols, the sideways ones, can spawn with necrotic, physical and void resistance, along with vitality, which is health. So keep an eye out for these, as they're a great way of fixing those important, but harder to get resistances. The little tiny 1x1 one one idols are mainly seat fillers, grab some helpful resist or life and maybe a bit of armor or mana here. Outside of the smaller idols, you will eventually start finding bigger idols. These vary from class to class and each one offers a set of different possible affixes. Learning what ones are available and good for your build is part of the build refinement process, so keep an eye out for nice combos. Anytime you can get both affixes to be good for your build is a big win. Some of these large idols can be very powerful, but you usually have to decide whether your resistances are good enough to use them over several smaller idols. That's the puzzle and fun of idols. To support the powerful crafting system that Last Epoch has, the game also features a powerful and easy to customize in-game loot filter. Gear drops identified in this game. As such, you are able to filter based on the actual random affixes on items. This can give you a huge advantage in crafting and gearing, as you can customize loot filters on a build by build basis. Here I'll go over some of the fundamentals and basic loot filter strategy that will get you going. Since crafting is so fundamental to this game, loot filters are implicitly also very fundamental as well, so it's a very good idea to at least learn the basics of how this works. Basic loot filtering strategy is to hide what isn't useful to you, and then highlight the things that are. Then, long term, you can refine by highlighting more specific things that will help you find and craft upgrades to progress your character. It can seem a bit overwhelming, but let's make this process as simple as possible, and it does end up being pretty simple. Play without a loot filter for a few levels and get yourself a complete set of gear for your character. Then you'll notice that you're only really looking for magic and rare items. For the most part, you won't need white normal items anymore. Even with crafting, you're better off crafting magical rares most of the time. So, we press Shift F to open up the in-game loot filter and add a hide rule. Select Add Rule, Add Condition, and make that condition Rarity, selecting Normal Items from the Rarity dropdown. Note that at the top it says in the rule name what it's doing, Hide All Normal Items. Click Add Rule and it'll go on the list. Next up, think about your build. What items will you never use? Maybe you're playing a sentinel and you don't think you'll ever use a wand, scepter, catalyst, quiver or bow. As such, we don't need to see those items ever. So what we'll do is we'll add another rule, add a condition and make that condition item type. Now we go through and select all of the item types that we don't want to see. 
We can rename the rule to something easier to remember and then add the rule. Now hold on, we still want to see special wands and stuff for other builds, right? Like uniques and set items? For sure, so let's fix that too. We'll now create a rule to override the hide rule that we just added for fancy things. Add a rule, select show, and add a condition, and select rarity. Select set, unique, and exalted items. Note that the name is show all set, unique, exalted items. Now we add this rule, and in our list, we make sure that it's always above the hide rules. Rules at the top of the list take priority, so put your shows above your hides, and your recolor and emphasis rules above everything else. As of this point, we now have a basic decluttering loot filter. As you play, you can add more things to your hide rules as you discover that they aren't what you need. When you get to the point where you're wearing all rare items and magic items stop being useful for the most part, we can then step things up to the next level. Let's click on our hide normal items rule, and in the rarity condition, let's also select magic to hide those as well and click update. Blue items are hidden now. However, what about the rare affixes and chase affixes for our build? Well, let's do what we did for fancy wands earlier and add a rule to override this hiding rule. This time though, we'll make sure that we really notice those items. For visibility, we select recolor and choose a color that we like. The emphasize option lets you capitalize all the letters in the loot label for if you really want it to stand out. Then we add a condition and make it affix. Now we can select what affixes get highlighted. You can experiment with this rule and add or remove things whenever you want. I suggest starting with class specific and selecting the ones that relate to your build. If you're not sure, you can always select all of them and trim them down as you decide that they aren't useful. You could also add things like movement speed and increased and hybrid health. Once you add this rule, even magic items with one of these affixes will now be highlighted. Just make sure this rule is on top of the hide rules. You now have a very functional loot filter refined a bit for your build and the skills to refine it further as you go. With that said, the community is always seeking to make things easier for people, so there are some presets that you can get. Heavy's loot filters are a good example which have presets for each class. To import a loot filter, simply copy the raw text of the filter to your clipboard and select add new loot filter and paste the clipboard contents. Keep in mind that even a great preset will need customization to specify it for your build. It's also a good idea to read the author's explanation for how their preset works and how it can be customized. Now folks, I hope this guide has been helpful in getting you going in Last Epoch. It's a fantastic game with a lot of potential. I've been playing since first alpha, so it's great to see so many new people trying it out. Please feel free to share any questions or beginner's tips of your own in the comments below. Thanks to EHG for sponsoring this guide. It took a long time to make and their support made it much easier to do. That's it for now. I'm Ziggy D, and thanks for watching.